All right, so the big question is this. Can we really ratify a state-originated or federal balanced budget amendment by the end of next year? Pretty interesting question, isn't it? Well, our guest says yes. This is according to Nick Dronius, who is with the Compact for America Educational Foundation. He's the president and constitutional scholar. That is a mouthful. For <laughs> we are so glad to have you here talking about this. Now, Nick has quite a, an impressive resume. Among the things that he is, has done and is doing, he's an expert with the Heartland Institute and the Federalist Society. He's also an advisory council member for the Our America Initiative. He previously served as general counsel, steering committee member, policy development director, and constitutional policy director for our friends at the Goldwater Institute. Now, Nick actually led the Goldwater Institute's successful challenge, yay, to Arizona's system of government campaign financing to the U.S. Supreme Court. So quite a, um, an excellent guest we have here today. Again, thanks to the folks at the Federalist Society for working uh, with us, as well as George Leaf, in bringing Nick Dronius here to the John Locke Foundation. Nick? fiddle with this, I'll be right with you. How's this working? First of all, thank you so much for coming out on a Monday uh, luncheon. Uh, I've, I've been just getting back from a 10-day tour in Washington, D.C., where Compact for America has organized a number of different conferences, one at ALEC, one at N uh, debate at NCSL, uh, a breakfast and a lunch bookending the Assembly of State Legislatures, which is considering the process of amending the Constitution from the states. And, and I'm pleased to say that we've got sponsor commitments for the Compact for a Balanced Budget that I'll be discussing in at least 10 states. And I'm hopeful that uh, we'll have even more in the near future. So the reason why I lead with this is that something is afoot. There is a huge and growing movement in the states, even when they meet in Washington, D.C., to amend the Constitution because we're tired of waiting in Washington to do what we know Washington will never do, which is restrain its own power. And right now, there are three major movements afoot. I'm here to talk about the Compact for America approach, which is the middle approach. And, and as you'll see, the, the reason why I favor this approach is, is that it is what we call Article 5 2.0. Article 5 is the part of the Constitution that authorizes the amendment process. It, not only empowers Congress, but empowers states to originate amendments. We've developed the compact approach, the interstate agreement approach to amending the Constitution so that we could plausibly say that you could get the job done in as few as 12 months. And as you'll see with the debt, this is something that we have to move on to fix rapidly. In three to seven years, it's going to be too late to fix this problem. We're going to be looking at a national bankruptcy amendment to repeal that part of the 14th Amendment that stops us from repudiating our debt at that point. So Compact for America is devoted to fixing the national debt because it's probably the most pressing and yet achievable reform that's on the horizon at the constitutional level. Unlike the other efforts, we also have an amendment you can look at. And on your chair and on your, uh, your table are a set of documents. I would encourage you to take them home. They make excellent reading. They're very heavy, so I don't want to take them back with me to Phoenix. So please, uh, please take them and read them. As you see in this presentation, though, that uh, over the past two, two and a half years, uh, when I have been working at Goldwater and then also side by side with my colleagues at Compact at the time, we have thought about every conceivable contingency in the Article 5 Amendment process. We have designed a policy product that gives maximum certainty about an untested route to an amendment and that gives maximum safety that we can ever expect in any political situation. And at the same time, we have an amendment worth fighting for. And here's why we're doing it. Folks, that is our national debt in nominal terms. And, and I, I know that some folks are going to say that, well, that's just nominal. It doesn't count. It doesn't reflect the effect of inflation. It doesn't affect, uh, show us the relationship to the national uh, GDP, the gross domestic product. Um, and, and what I say to those folks, first of all, is 
how do you know you can trust any of those measures? The reality is they just changed the definition of GDP last year. And they all said it was just a minor tweak. Well, the fact is that on a forward-going basis, the new definition of GDP has our GDP accelerating much faster than it did before. And if you look at measures of the ratio of our unfunded spending programs and GDP, that measure got 25% better after they changed the definition. <laughs> and we've seen already when it comes to inflation that that definition changes all the time. Usually you can trace that to pressure on cost of living adjustments. Suddenly things that used to matter in the definition don't matter anymore when we have to increase our cost of living adjustments. So the concern that we should all have before saying, well, let's adjust this exponential growth pattern to reflect its real relationship to GDP and inflation is to recognize with sort of a cold, hard reality that we can't necessarily trust even those numbers. And so I like to start with what we can know, the absolute dollar pattern that we see in the debt. Because no matter how you look at this, this is an unsustainable, obviously not self-limiting pattern. This is an exponential growth pattern which shows no tendency to restrict itself. So now I'll indulge you and you will look at it, the ratio to the GDP. Folks, we are currently at over 100% of GDP. Now by way of comparison, in 2007, Greece was at 105% of GDP. We are now where everyone panicked with Greece. And we've been hanging around there for a few years now, despite all the talk of everything improving. This is not a sustainable place. Now we're only doing better than Greece because we have a more dynamic economy, despite my brethren's uh, you know, ancient history. Um, Greece is not a particularly dynamic economy, and it, it is also not the reserve currency capital of the world. But this is not sustainable. The only time we've ever been at this place before was at the height of World War II. And unlike the end of World War II, when we were the only economy standing and we could plausibly grow our way out of this debt, we're not the only economy standing. In fact, we've got tremendous competition in the East, a place called China, which I believe their GDP in absolute terms just passed ours. And that's not to mention the fundamental problem of unlimited borrowing capacity. Because Folks, it's not just about the numbers. We are essentially commandeering most of the income of our kids and their kids through borrowing for our purposes, whether they actually benefit us or not. It's not mostly to the benefit of the kids that are paying for it. 40% of this last budget deal is borrowed money. We've had a history, a track record over the past few days for between 38 and 45 percent of the budget being borrowed. This is insanity. Can you imagine if in your own finances, 38 to 45 percent that you spent was on your credit card year to year to year to year after, you know, with no end in sight? And so let me bring this home. I am at Compact for America having left Goldwater Institute two months ago because there's nothing more important to me than to not destroy the future of my two kids. And when I look out at my friends and my colleagues and their kids or their grandkids, I say to myself, how can we as this generation do what we're doing to our kids? This is the absolute height of immorality and irresponsibility. To seize their incomes, to basically tax them without representation, and to try to fix the underlying fiscal problem, which is this. The reason why we're in the position we're in is if you give unlimited borrowing capacity to politicians, suddenly there are no limits on what they can promise to get elected. Government becomes magical. You want a cell phone? You got a cell phone. You want health care? You, you got health care. They can borrow from the future with no immediate political costs, only political gains. It is unlimited borrowing capacity that creates the illusion of unlimited resources, which is the source, the prime cause of unlimited government. I'm not saying that limiting borrowing capacity is going to get us to the original meaning of the Constitution overnight, but you're never going to get to a point where arguing about priorities and first principles has any pragmatic meaning if you don't limit the apparent resources of government. There is no way, no matter how persuasive you are, take Ronald Reagan for an example that you can overcome an opposition that's going to give the, other, give the constituent anything they want with just you know, soaring rhetoric. 
It didn't work with Reagan, and I'm no Reagan, and I haven't found a Reagan yet on the horizon. In order to have a plausible, pragmatic case for a population that is looking for pragmatism most of the time, for limited government, for sustainable programs, you have to dispel the illusion of unlimited resources. You have to bring into government the reality of scarcity, and you have to do it before we crash the system. Folks, if there's any anarcho-capitalists out there, and I, I, I have to admit I hang out with some <laughs> from time to time, we don't want to crash the system under the current cultural context, unless you think Ferguson is a reasonable reaction to what happened. We have as much a chance crashing our system as generating a Somalia as a libertarian nirvana. And that's not something that we should, shirk, we should put on our kids' foreheads and say, hey, guess what? You know, this is unsustainable. We'll just have to crash the system, and then it will sort itself out. That's not responsible. And we still have time. We still have time. Because this statement is true. Over 220 years ago, a gentleman by the name of Thomas Jefferson, who knew something about debt. Thomas Jefferson said if there was one amendment that would restore the Constitution, by the way, this is in 1798, so he was really getting impatient with where the Constitution was going. If there was one amendment that would restore the Constitution, it is taking away the borrowing capacity of the federal government. And again, that's because of the dynamic that unlimited borrowing capacity provides. No principled person, no limited government type can outcompete in the political marketplace an opponent who is giving the constituents anything they want at no cost. No parchment barrier can stop the federal government from growing under the influence of that dynamic. Thomas Jefferson saw that early, even when, for the most part, the federal government was stuck within the confines of the meaning, the original meaning of the enumerated powers. Because he recognized that that's not a cure-all. You know, even if the federal government were somehow magically living entirely within the strictures of the enumerated powers, they could still waste gobs of money with unlimited borrowing capacity. Don't you remember what happened with the military base closures in the 80s and 90s? I mean, we may have thought that, that most of those bases were necessary in the Cold War, but no one can doubt that a huge chunk of those bases were there for patronage. And nobody can debate that that's fully within the enumerated powers of the federal government. So it's not true that restoring the Constitution to this mythical place where we all suddenly respect the enumerated powers is going to shrink the size and scope and irresponsibility of government. It's just not true. And what's more is it's just not realistic. Again, go back to the political mechanism. How does someone arguing for originalism, for a limited government, compete effectively over the long run with a guy who gives everyone goodies? We're never going to be in a society where 99% of America are philosopher kings. We're always going to be in a society where, at best, 5 to 10% of the people are going to think the right thoughts in terms of policy. That's just reality. So we have to control the primary cause of the growth of unlimited government, and that is the appearance of unlimited resources. What's the solution? Well, here's a problem for us all, and that is we've got to get to 38 states with any solution. And then, I, you know, 25 of those states, I think we've got a pretty good shot at with any of Mark Levin's amendments. But beyond that, it's not going to happen, folks. Not in the near term. Not if we have to fix the debt in the next three to seven years, which is what I believe and what our experts believe on the economic side. So you need to have a plausible amendment, one that's poll tested, one that's been vetted. This amendment that's in the compact, that actually can be assessed, it's discussed in the materials before you, has been vetted for two and a half years, not just legislatively, but with experts from a variety of think tanks. It's been poll tested at the cost of $50,000 to ensure that all of its policy components command at least simple majority support, even from Democrats. In fact, overall, each of these policy components poll test in a nationwide poll at between 61 and 81 percent support. This is what you need to get the job done. You need to have a plausible political product that fixes the debt as best we can under the circumstances. What does it do? First of all, we impose a fixed debt limit. 
And we define terms in such a way as to prevent all the gaming that is going on in the states that have balanced budget amendments. And we could talk about this in the Q&A, but basically there's five categories of gaming that we've observed over the past 150 years in the states. This amendment, by virtue of the definitions it uses, either prohibits them or strongly deters them. So what we do is we establish a real debt limit that cannot be evaded easily. This debt limit only has one source of flexibility. It involves recognizing that we need external discipline on Washington. We cannot trust Washington to control its own debt limit. Did you know we don't even have a debt limit right now because Congress suspended it until March and it's set to reset it whatever the heck they've borrowed. Congress is an addict. You don't give an addict control over his supply. And so what do we propose? We say let's have a referendum process to the states. 26 states would have to approve any increase in this fixed debt limit. Now, is that going to guarantee we'll never get an increase in the debt? No. But if it plays out like Medicaid expansion and health care exchanges played out, we know we got at least a 50-50 shot of blocking these proposals. And that in and of itself will cause a change in mentality in Washington. They will no longer be able to bank on just getting whatever additional borrowing capacity they want. Suddenly, the reality of scarcity will come home to Washington. Suddenly, the need to prioritize would actually become pragmatic. Suddenly, we'd have a reason to budget. Suddenly, maybe, we'd have a reason to resort to first principles in deciding how to prioritize and how to budget. We'll never get to that last step when we're up against Mr. Magical Cat. Mr. Magical Cat will outcompete us every day until the system crashes. And you know what? We don't want to crash this system under our current cultural context. Now, some folks are going to say, well, how do you prevent games of chicken? Turns out it's real simple. You know what the president does right now under the debt limit when it exists? He puts a gun to grandma's head minutes before the debt limit is going to kick in, and everyone folds. Well, that gun to the head, I'm not going to pay out these Social Security checks, or I'm not going to give the veterans their checks, that's called impoundment. Whether you think the president constitutionally has an impoundment power or not, he uses it all the time. That's why he wins all the time. Because the Congress has no response to that other than to try to repeal the appropriation, which requires whose signature? The president's. That's why the Congress always loses. There's no way to beat the president when he got a gun to grandma's head. How do you fix that? You have an impoundment requirement that forces the president to do that months before hitting the debt limit. So that now he's got to sit there and hold that gun to grandma for months of scrutiny. Then you give Congress the ability to override those impoundments with equal or greater amounts without his signature. Bam. No more game of chicken. And even better, we have total transparency on what is at stake in the debt limit fight. And folks, we're, you know, I'm not you know, under any illusion that putting on the table what's at stake in the debt limit fight might encourage more increases in the debt limit. But we can never fix, public, we can never fix fiscal policy if we don't know what the numbers are and what the trade-offs are. It's sort of a basic requisite that we get transparency on what is at stake before we ever can turn around and actually fix fiscal policy. So this, at, very, at the very least, puts all the cards on the table. And we can start with something. Next thing is people say, well, what about taxes? You know, they could just easily close this deficit with raising taxes. It would be terrible. And I, you know, my first reaction, forgive me for saying this, but debt is taxes, folks. I mean, who's paying these, this debt? And out of what? I mean, if it isn't from explicit taxes, it's coming out of inflation because this is the money supply that we're increasing. And who's paying these taxes? Our kids and their kids. People who have no vote in this process. So what kind of taxes are debt? Taxation without representation. So folks, a debt limit is a tax limit. And it's a limit on the worst kind of taxes, taxes without representation. So you don't tell me that you're in favor of a tax limit, but not a debt limit. <laughs> you can't be both. But there is a valid point that we could overshoot in raising a new revenues. That we could destroy the seed corn. That we could favor our kids at our expense imprudently. That's a very real risk. And we see it in Europe right now with our austerity plans. So we have to have an incentive structure that makes sure 
that we don't destroy our seed corn by excessively raising taxes in the near term to protect our kids from taxes in the future. Here's our solution. Draw the tax fight to a narrow gap. Who here saw 300? Who here knows the Battle of Thermopylae? The Spartans. Now, we Greeks say 300 Spartans held off 100,000 Persians. Now, the, the numbers might have been lower than that. I sometimes say a million. It looks like a million in the, in the, in the movie. But what we want to do with tax policy is bring the fight for revenue to that narrow gap. How do we do that? We say you can knock yourself out with new tax revenues with simple majorities if and only if you replace the income tax completely with a consumption tax, a sales tax. If and only if you can do that. We say you can knock yourself out with new revenues with simple majority support if and only if you flatten the tax code. You get rid of deductions, credits, and exemptions. Knock yourself out if you think you can do that. And you can get to increased revenues with new tariffs or fees as well using simple majorities. Everything else requires a two-thirds vote of each house. Now, why do we draw the fight there? Well, home, who thinks it's easier to get rid of the homeowner's deduction than to get two-thirds of each house? Who thinks it's easier to start taxing all the barbers and lawyers that can kind of evade income taxation because they're in a service economy, but they wouldn't evade that under a consumption tax? See, we're bringing the fight for revenue where the most powerful special interests occupy the spaces. And that will cause spending cuts to look a lot more attractive. <laughs> Does it guarantee we won't get revenue increases? No, but it makes sure that we've first done every plausible spending cut politically before we turn to the revenue side. Because we know that no ambitious politician is going to want to take on the homeowner's deduction crowd until he's already maxed out his spending cuts. So folks, what do you think the chances are of Congress proposing this on their own with two-thirds of each house? Raise your hand if you think there's a shot at it. All right. We've already seen the problem, the debt limit. We brought it to the states. We've dealt with the tax problem, and we've seen that. So we know that Congress can't be trusted. That's why you resort to the state origination of amendments under Article 5. This, by the way, is an actual copy of the text of Article 5. And I like to lead with this. Is there anyone here that's fearful of the convention process of, of a pro, of, well, maybe fearful is the wrong word. Is there anyone here skeptical of the convention process? OK. I like to lead with this for, for your benefit, because if you notice, the convention process is in the same sentence as the congressional process. Okay, and if you look at them, they're both ratified by the same threshold of two-thirds, or three-fourths, I'm sorry, of the states. And it's all part of one sentence. And so the first thing I'd like to point out is that you know, most of the founders were attorneys. If they were intending to have two fundamentally different powers described here, this is not how they would draft it. I mean, just from the structure of this amendment, you know that we're basically looking at the same amendment power exercised one or the other way. If they intended to have a blow up the Constitution power, they wouldn't have put it in the same sentence and subject to the same ratification power as, as a congressional proposal of amendments. And so you can see, just looking at the text, the most plausible interpretation of the convention power is that it's a proposal of amendments, not a resetting of the Constitution. And let me also emphasize another thing. The critical question on what the convention does it has to be answered by the meaning of the word application. Now in the Q&A, I've got a whole bunch of evidence that I can walk you through, and I encourage you to ask me questions about this. But here's the bottom line. The word application meant, meant a petition. And petitions were done at the time of the founding for all sorts of very specific things. And when Congress granted an application, it usually gave what the application asked for. And so the reason why you know the convention was designed to follow what the legislature wants is that the usual practice in calling and granting an application, any application, was to adopt what that request was, if they're going to actually respond to it as it, as, it laid it, as it made its request. So the bottom line is this. You can analyze the meaning of the word application, and whatever the states are asking for in terms of an amendment in their application, by virtue of the mandatory obligation of Congress to call the convention, would necessarily define what the convention is doing. That being said, 
we have a process problem. And here's what we've had to grapple with at Compact for America. In order to get an amendment out of the states, there are six independent stages. You've got to get two-thirds of the state legislatures. You've got to hope at least 26 states send delegates to the convention. You've got to hope Congress actually calls the convention. You've got to hope that the convention actually generates something useful. You've got to hope that Congress then plays along with ratification referral and sends it out to the states. That takes a, 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 a resolution. And then finally, you've got to get 38 states to ratify it, either by in-state convention, which requires its own set of legislation in many states, or by resolution of their legislature. So there's a reason why Patrick Henry looked at Article 5 and opposed ratification of the Constitution in the Virginia Convention. He, he, Patrick Henry, for six hours, railed against ratifying the Constitution because he thought Article 5 was a ruse. There was no way the states were ever going to use this successfully to actually constrain the federal government when there were only 10 to 13 states being contemplated for the Union, let alone when we've got as many as we have today, 50 states. I think we're, we had 55 according to the President the other day. But, um, but the reality is, Patrick Henry had a point. And this is something that if you're in the Article 5 advocacy movement, you have to recognize. This is not an illegitimate point. And what's worse about it is, if you don't even know what your amendment is going in, and you don't even know what your process is going in, how do you make the sale? One of the guys that I, I've pitched and hopefully giving us money someday, first thing he said to us is, you've got to have a product to sell it. There's no product here. There's barely a process. It's the broadest outlines of a product. How do you make this sale? Over 100 pieces of legislation. So what do you do? Give up? We got a better idea. Using an agreement among the states, we can consolidate all of the moving parts the states control in the amendment process. Everything from the amendment to the application to the selection of delegates, and even the ultimate ratification in one piece of legislation that the threshold number needed for ratification, 38 states, 3 fourths of the states, join. All of these different consolidated components are passed as one package. So you can get 38 states to join it, and you're done. You don't ever have to go back to another state. The whole entire process is done. You don't have more than one stage. One stage, you know what you're selling, and you know who you're selling it to. We take both of Congress's roles, the calling of the convention and the selection of ratification referral, compress them into one resolution passed with simple majorities. You get in and out of Congress once. And then the convention meets and proposes the amendment within 24 hours according to the rules that are in the agreement. You restrict the number of legislative acts from 100 to 39. You shrink the number of legislative stages from 6 to 3. And you make it plausible, plausible, to get this done in one year, one session year. Because it's all potentially one legislative stage in those sessions. For the first time ever, we have an answer to Patrick Henry. And this is the Compact for America approach. We went live with the Compact for a Balanced Budget, which has a powerful balanced budget amendment, the one we talked about last session. We played in four states. We succeeded in two, Alaska and Georgia. A 50% batting average, and we had almost no resources, just the strength of the product. That's Article 5 2.0. It solves the marketing problem of not having a product. It also provides safeguards. One of the things that we did in the compact is that we had it peer reviewed by Andy Schlafly, uh, the son of Phyllis Schlafly, the famous Eagle Forum, who opposes Article 5. For two and a half months, we went back and forth in emails, back and forth in, in telephone conference calls, and we said, Andy, poke holes. Tell me where we've left any opportunity for this process to run wild, short of a coup d'etat. We can't control a coup d'etat. If you think a coup d'etat is going to happen when you have a convention, you know, I disagree with you respectfully. We, but you know, it's sort of like saying you know, murder laws can't stop murder, so we should never have a murder law. It doesn't follow. Um, the reality is you create laws in order to maximize the chances people will follow good behavior. And you create a compact that fully safeguards the process because it maximizes the chances the process will be followed. And guess what? We put in 17 safeguards to protect against this process ever getting derailed. I'll give you a few examples. Andy said, well, how do I know where the litigation is going to be? I want this litigated in Texas because I trust them in Texas. 
So we put a venue selection clause. All litigation takes place in Texas. Turns out it's pretty common in compacts. And by the way, there are over 200 compacts in existence. The average state is a party to 20 or more. Next thing Andy said to us is, you know, I don't like all these delegates who might be elected officials, governors, and so on, taking with them their sovereign powers into this room. How do we know that they're not going to somehow combine this into a new form of government with, you know, bringing it into the room? So we added a provision that says that everyone has to take a leave of absence from their official position when they serve at the convention and that they only have their individual powers when they're there. And we went on and on and on along these lines. But the biggest way that we control for any sort of runaway is the first order of business for every delegate of every member state is to vote into place rules that require a 24-hour vote up or down on this particular amendment. If they do anything other than that as their first order of business, they automatically forfeit all authority to act and are automatically subject to recall and replacement. And 38 states, which would be joining the compact, are immediately mandated to send their attorney generals out to bring them home. Now, you don't have to say to yourself, well, maybe they could win that fight to realize that a pragmatic politician is probably not going to want to go there, at least in the near future. But we still have a problem in Article 5, and that is Congress. Remember, Congress, even with our approach, has to be approached once. You have to get a resolution passed with simple majorities. If you don't use a compact, you've got to go to Congress twice. Who here thinks the states have an equal megaphone, if nothing else, compared to Congress? Is the media going to be able to amplify the voice of 38 states or 34 states or however many states you have in your Article 5 movement, like you can amplify the voice of Washington? If nothing else, this is a huge political problem when it comes to getting Congress to do the right thing in the process. So what do you do? The compact forms an interstate agency, an actual governmental body. As soon as two states join, and guess what? It exists. There is now a compact commission populated the former Lieutenant Governor Mead Treadwell of Alaska and Represent Paulette Rakestraw of Georgia. This is a force multiplier. It provides the megaphone for the member states to compete with Congress. It provides a platform for the states to unify and be persistent in this goal. And here's the other thing. Even though the compact self-repeals on April 12, 2021, another Andy Schlafly suggestion, this is a persistent institution. It can receive appropriations. If Congress wants to fight, 38 states can match Congress with a lot of resources to bring that fight. And it's not because we want that fight. We just want people who are politicians who want to do what's in their own self-interest to see the wisdom of going along rather than fighting. This is how you do it. That being said, we still have a real problem with Congress. You know, Article 5 says Congress shall call the convention so they have a constitutional obligation to call the convention, right? And we know Congress always follows the Constitution. And also the court system always compels Congress to follow the Constitution. So we've got nothing to worry about. Wrong. We have to assume Congress will only do what's in Congress's best interest, at best. So you need to have multiple ways to approach Congress. It's not enough to have the institution that provides the megaphone and the threat of litigation. What you want to do is have the ability to approach Congress whenever you want. That's what the resolution for the compact approach gives us. We can pass it at any time, at any time. And in fact, Paul Gosar of Arizona right now has it drafted. I've met with a number of folks in Congress. It's ready to go in January. And with the latest election results, this is entirely possible. Now, if we fail, you can try again and you can try again. This way, we don't have to wait for only one tactical approach to Congress, which is when we've massed 34 or 38 states. We can do it whenever a hole in the line reveals itself. And here's why you have reason to hope, and this is where I'm going to end this, and we can go into Q&A if we have any time. Did you know that every major balanced budget amendment proposal coming directly from Congress has secured at least simple majorities of each House of Congress? Did you know that? That they've fallen short by just a handful of votes of the two-thirds threshold? almost every time? And there's been over a dozen of these proposals over the past 25 years. The reality is, 
Getting simple majorities behind a balanced budget amendment, even in Congress, is doable. There's a track record to point to. And so if we have tactical flexibility, if we have an institution representing the states, we can win. That's why I'm with Compact for America. Thank you very much. How do I want to handle the questions? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, Joe? Uh, two points. Uh, you didn't mention the media. And uh, I could just, I, mean, I, I know locally we have uh, our, our, uh, our House organ, the Democrats, the News and Observer. And they, we will hear nationwide the sky is falling. Yeah. Additional to that, you're going to hear Congress saying, okay, if this is what you want to do, guess what will happen? We're not going to send money from the federal government to the states for your roads, for your schools. I mean, you're going to see a yep. hardball. And I, and I don't think the public is understood enough to understand the spirit of the problem. The Tea Party tried to bring this up four years ago. Yep. And they were laughed away. They were told, they're the nuts. And the, the argument is going to be difficult to close the number of Okay, I'll send you a copy of our polling data, and I'll show you that the polling data shows any politician who's self-interested that there's a good market for this amendment. And in the end, you know, we can count on politicians to be self-interested, to want to get elected, and if we can show them that this helps them get elected, Democrat or Republican, that will be the ticket. Now in terms of the media, the reality is we've designed our amendment to be very reasonable. It's got a huge line of credit. You know, if it got ratified tomorrow, the line of credit would literally be $21 trillion. I mean, that's a lot of money. It's not like it brings big government to a screeching halt overnight. It, simply says there's got to be a limit somewhere. 49 states have some kind of debt limit or balanced budget requirement. This is, it is a radically weird thing that the federal government has nothing, right? And I don't think it's a hard sell to the media. I, I mean, we've been at this now for two and a half years with Compact for America. We've got a lot of positive press. And one of the ways we've done that is I've formed a partnership with some folks on the left. I mean, I've got Larry Lessig on our advisory council. If you know who Larry Lessig is, he is about as hard left as you can find these days. He's personal friends with Justice Kagan. But I've got him committed in two public media documents, a Washington Post letter to the editor and in a National Constitution Center piece, committed that states control the Article V process. Now, he may not like the BBA, but suddenly the current modern day Lawrence tribe is yielding to state control over this process, which is a huge, huge win. So don't think that we're going to lose this fight. You know, a well thought out product vetted for two and a half years by guys who are as smart as me or better can win. And, and that's what, so we, the, the thing to understand here is this is not a hard right play. And it's not designed to give us a wish list of hard right policies. All that this amendment is doing is what 49 states already do, which is recognize there's got to be scarcity and borrowing capacity. All we're doing when we pitch this to the media is say, look, are we just going to keep stealing from our kids? And I'll give you one argument that almost always silences the left, that, that, that makes them go, hmm. I say to them, you guys must oppose the fact that women have the right to vote. Wait, wait what do you mean? Well, you, you keep telling me about how the democratic process is going to protect our kids from being overly burdened with our, with our debt spending. But the reality is, is that they don't have any stake in our political fight. They're not being represented. You know, we may love our kids, but we probably love our kids no more than we love, than, than, than husbands love their wives before women had the right to vote. And yet, yet, we all recognize that nobody can represent the interests of women as well as they can. And that if you're going to have a democratic process that represents their interests well, they have to have the right to vote. The problem is we can't get in a time machine to have our kids be heard on what we're burdening them with. So what do we do? What's the next best thing? We have to build a structure into the Constitution that represents their interests, that limits the extent to which we burden them. That is what a balanced budget amendment is. And so far, I've debated hard left guys three times so far in the past six months. And each time, they're kind of like, I don't know what to say. So look, what we're talking about here really, folks, is not crazy right wing stuff. This is basic good governance, right? I mean, think about it this way. Let's say you're a crazy left winger and you just want to have government do all kinds of things. Probably you don't want to just burn money in a big pile, right? 
you, you probably want to do things. And what I say to the left is I say, look, if you think you have unlimited resources, why would you ever do anything in a reasonable way? I mean, what would, what would be your measure of efficiency? How would you know if the program was working well or not if you just shovel more money at it? It, you, almost, you have to have a sense of scarcity in your resources even to make a workable, crazy socialist program. At least somewhat workable, right? So you bring these points back home and you see why the consensus in the states is so overwhelmingly at the state level in favor of a debt limit. It's because it's just basic common sense. And it, it doesn't matter where you are in the political spectrum. Anybody who believes in valuing their kids' own in, interests and having not burning money in big piles is going to have to support a debt limit. Yes, sir. Uh, well, first of all, I, without getting into too much detail, I really have doubts that Congress under Article One, Section 10 would approve this compact because I think it would be billboarded as an end run around Article I think you've got a big problem there. But let's assume you get past that. The big problem I see is when I read the, and I haven't studied it, obviously. It's the first time I've seen it. Yep. When I look at your enforcement mechanism, it's really just section four of your proposed amendment. Good luck. Good All right. Time you're asking the president. All right. We have a president right now that oh. refuses to do anything. Okay, let, 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 me, let me just take that in pieces. First, um, the reality is Congress has a role in Article 5 no matter whether you use a compact or not, right? Congress has a physical impediment to the call and has a physical impediment to the ratification referral. Congress can jam up an Article 5 effort in a lot of ways. It could attach to the call total control over the convention process, which 25 bills have already proposed in Congress over the past 30 years. Or even on the back end, on the ratification referral side, they could set a sunset of like three months, which is the shortest period of time anything has ever been ratified. And boom, any significant or somewhat controversial amendment will never get ratified. So the first point I make in response is understand, as much as you'd hate to think that Congress has a role in this, that Congress has an incredibly powerful leverage point in Article 5. So the question is, how do you minimize that power? Do you go to Congress twice, or do you go to Congress once? I, I don't disagree with okay, that. So I, just, I just think that assuming that they'll go along with this. Is, all right. Yeah. But, as they can. But, but wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me just respond. I, I, wait, well, I, let me address this point. Our polling data is the key. You go in there with a product that tells them they're going to get elected if they do it, and they're going to get unelected if they don't. There is no evidence that I see that congressmen don't like getting elected and don't like getting unelected. And so the assertion that you're making, granted, plausible, a hypothetical we could test, unless you've got polling data to prove it, it's just an assertion. We've got polling data that we can make a pitch to left and right members of Congress that this enhances their career. We don't even have to get to the point of talking policy. That's pretty persuasive. Now, on the enforcement side, folks, he, what he's referring to is Section 4 of the BBA has you know, the impoundment feature. Remember, the president, at, at a certain point, 98% of borrowing has to designate impoundments. To, and that 98% number is chosen to ensure that you're designating impoundments several months before hitting the wall on the debt limit. And then Congress has a simple majority to override that impoundment without any presidential sign-on, okay? So that you don't have the situation today where Congress has no choice but to fold when the gun comes out to, to grandma's head. The argument is that the president won't exercise that power. Um, th that therefore the threat of impeachment for not exercising that power is, is an empty is, is a toothless tiger. Now, first of all, seriously, I mean, have you ever seen any executive ever not exercise power that they have? I mean, the, the reality is that, that, again, is an empirical assertion that is contrary to all of our experience. Find me, in the past hundred years, a single executive who didn't exercise to the nth degree whatever power they had. The one you got right now with the immigration law. But, but, but he did. He exercised all kinds of new numbers of power, right? So. Well, well, but this, but the thing is, we are giving the president, we are basically formalizing what, what he does already. So we have every expectation that he'll continue to do it. But even if you're right, let's say Congress, let's just say the president doesn't make the impoundments, okay? Our spending limit imposes an automatic sequester limiting spending to tax cash flow if the debt limit is hit. 
at 40% of our, our budget being borrowed. That's a gigantic sequester. Now, a big government guy is not going to want that to happen. Ted Cruz is going to be like, <sighs> but a, a future President Obama is not going to go, I'm going to show it to them. I, I'm just going to let that sequester happen. It's not the politics of the situation. But let's even assume that, that it would be. And Congress and the President both don't even respond and they let the sequester happen. By clearly designating that the President engaged in an impeachable offense by not impounding, we enable Congress to blame the President without ambiguity. And if they don't blame the President for the resulting sequester, who do you think gets blamed? They do. That's all the political incentive that I think you need to encourage Congress to use that power. And to further deter the President, who thinks more than a few steps ahead, to not <coughs> refrain from using his power. So when you think about the actual, if you game out the political decisions here, the best, most logical, even if totally unprincipled, pragmatic decision the President could make would be to use the power that he has to make impoundments. That being said, the ultimate enforcement mechanism built into this is the particular provision that we say illegal debt is void. And let me just tell you a little story why this is important. One of the things that people say is, okay, you put a limit on debt, what stops them from just issuing with a wink and a nudge you know, non full faith and credit debt of some kind that we haven't imagined yet, right? It's possible. We see this at local level. Well, here's what. We specifically say anything other than the kind of debt that's authorized in this amendment is void. Here's a little story to think why that's important. We objected to a $100 million bond issuance to subsidize the Coyotes hockey team in Arizona a couple years ago. We wrote a letter a pretty milk toasty, not very aggressive letter to Moody's saying, you know, this kind of looks like an unconstitutional subsidy, and by the way, it might be void. That letter alone blocked the underwriting of that $100 million subsidy. Now, in the con current financial context of the federal government, what do you think a letter like that would do to the bond markets if any sort of game playing was going on on the side? It would make it very hard to sell that debt at any sort of reasonable interest rate, and this is the key. If the federal government basically creates these sort of unforeseen junk bonds that are deemed void and they manage to sell them at huge interest rates, who's going to feel that pain? Current voters. So no longer do we have this mechanism where you're shifting the costs of these bad decisions to kids who can't vote. Instead, you're bringing it home. And you're ending political careers. So this is the key. The ultimate enforcement mechanism that comes back to us is the political system, which is where we want to be. Where, again, the idea, the philosophy here is to have the kids have their interests represented in the system. And so we do that in a variety of different ways. Any other questions? Do we have time? Yes, one more. It's vulnerable to litigation. <laughs> Everything in life is vulnerable to litigation. Uh, and so the question that I would pose is, is litigation, where would litigation try to block this? Well, right now, you know, before we passed this compact, everyone said you couldn't do the compact without congressional consent. We pointed to case law that says you, you can, as long as it doesn't take away federal power. And we've designed this compact not to do anything until 38 states join, even though we have a commission. Nobody's suing the commission because they, you know, people know that you can't really, there's no case law for that. Um, it, it, later on, could they sue when you get to 38 states? We've designed this process to move so rapidly, literally, the moment we have 38 states, if we've already got the congressional resolution, it will be no more than six weeks before we're, to the, we're at the convention. And 24 hours later, the convention's over. Either we have a proposed amendment or not. You, it's going to be hard to get any li litigation moving fast enough to block that. It's going to be hard to get courts willing to intercede on a scale of, of program like this where you've got 38 states and simple majorities of Congress all pointing in one direction. I mean. I mean, with all due respect to the Chief Justice, I mean, look at how he ruled on, on Obamacare with, with, with what some people thought was not a whole lot of political pressure on him, right? I mean, courts don't want to be in the middle of a major political push like this. So I think that we've minimized, by moving this fast, compressing it, moving it fast, the risk of litigation disrupting it is minimized. Is it eliminated? No, you can't eliminate litigation. Folks, I don't want you to all think this is a silver bullet. It's not. And by the way, although I put most of my eggs in the compact basket, I support all of the Article 5 efforts because of there being unique risks to this approach. 
But I think that if you think this through and read the materials and take them home, you'll, th you'll see that we've designed this process to, in consideration of all contingencies. That we've maximized rewards, we've minimized risks, and in life, what more can you do? Thank you.